Hi, uh, thank you, Scott, for this very nice uh, introduction. We are going to have now a roundtable discussion called uh, The Future of Scientific Publishing, When to Go to New Venues, When to Stick to Traditional Journals. And this is going, going to be co-chaired by myself, Professor Jean Mauhi, and Professor Bernard Bowney. So I'd like to invite the two of them to come here to the podium. And the way we organize this is that uh, we put a few slides, uh, a few from each one of us, and so each one of us will talk about his uh, slides for a few minutes. But this should be very brief, just to give you like a very, very brief uh, introduction uh, slash overview. And then from there we'll have an open discussion. And the basic uh, kind of fundamental question is, when do you stick to traditional journals that are of course online but were created in print and still exist in print? and have um, like a page limitation and become increasingly selective? And, do, and when do you go to this new uh, type of internet-based open access journals? So uh, Professor Bowney, he is very, has a, uh, made a huge contribution to that because he was the person responsible for our fields, kind of a component of PLOS one, which was the, I think the most successful open publication journal from the Public Library of Science. So uh, the Public Library of Science has uh, PLOS, biology, genetics, medicine, and those have a, a restriction to how many papers they publish. They have like, you know, monthly issues, very much like a traditional journal. And PLOS one was a, a kind of conceptual um, kind of paradigm shift. So uh, I'll begin talking more about the traditional journals, uh, then Bernard will talk about um, his experience with PLOS one and open publishing in general. And then Jin Mao, he, who is the now editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Royal Australian College, Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, will talk about his experience with a society-based journal. So um, I'll begin here with a few words myself about um, scientific publishing and kind of what has been happening so far in the traditional uh, media. So as you can see there, it's a very high risk uh, sport in which you have a fantastic reward. I hear that actually in China, um, if you have a paper published in Nature, the next day the, the Ministry of Science and Technology gives several million dollars to your lab. So um, you can have that very enticing piece of cheese there, but it's very hard to, to get there. Yes. So one thing that people uh, comment and it's kind of a perception by many people, is that publishing in that kind of a publication, very high end, is really like a club. And some people get an in and you see their names, you know, often in those same uh, journals. And other people, you know, you can send very interesting material and doesn't get past the door. So is it really a club? And if so, how could you possibly uh, break through? So will people who are not part of the club publish there? Because I mean, if, in a sense, if you are part of the club and you send the papers to the journal and they accept it, then there is no issue really. I think the problem is for people who are not part of the club. So um, you have to think a little bit about the perspective of the other side. So what do the journals want? I mean, you want to publish there, but what do they want? So they want uh, cash. So cash comes in the form of advertising, uh, publicity, uh, marketing, etc. So that's tied very closely to visibility and increasingly to high citations. So if it's a paper that you're writing that will is likely to be highly cited, you should somehow make that somewhat self-evident because that's what the, the journals want. So there's always this perennial war for the highest uh, impact factor. They also like very much to have articles in the lay press that cite that particular journal. And so if the work is, has an angle that could be newsworthy, that's also helpful. And they of course want to you know, enhance and preserve, enhance and further develop their reputation. Because it's so competitive to publish in these journals, molecular psychiatry, which has an impact factor of 15, in the last year, I think, on average, for original research articles, we've accepted 4%. In the last six months, it's 3%. So how, when anything is at in this very high percentile level, how do you distinguish something that's like on the you know 3.5 percentile versus something that's in the 2.9 percentile? They're essentially the same piece of work. 
So yes, if the work is poor and bad, then is you know not that interesting. It's not the case. There's no discussion there. But if the work is of very high quality, it gets to a point that whether it ends up published in one venue or another is essentially a matter of luck. It depends on their flow that month, what, what else they've published. Sometimes if the, that journal has just accepted a few papers in one area, they may not want the next paper that could even be better. But in the very same area, sometimes they want to put a special issue together on that topic. Then the next paper is very much welcome. And you don't know that a priori. So sometimes they've commissioned a very important person or Nobel Prize winner or someone really famous to write an editorial on a topic. And there are two papers already. If a third one comes, it would make the thing even more interesting. So you may be that third paper that they really like, you know, would like to have. Or that whole effort may have already gone to press. And then when you come with the fourth paper, like, you know, while the other that whole you know, combination of two, three good papers with an editorial is already in production. They may not want your work at all. So there is an element of luck in the sense that it's not that whatever you send will be published, but there, uh, when the competition is very fierce, there are a lot of other factors that uh, come into play. And in a sense, it does make a journal look good to reject uh, a lot of papers. So in the publishing world, uh, they call your work copy, and tough is uh, a very good thing. So uh, this is not that you know every paper will end up in these journals, but this is to give you an idea of what like you know the top end of the traditional uh, publishing domain is looking for. So Nature likes work that's conceptually novel. So if you have something that's the first time that something like this has ever been thought of or done or demonstrated, that's very helpful not only for Nature but for any other journal. The same thing, uh, science puts it a little different, but that's if you can kind of. Uh, it's the case for your work, and you can pitch it in like that. It's very helpful to show that it's uh, the first publication of a new concept or the last nail on the coffin of a theory. So if you definitely prove that something that everybody believed in is wrong, that's also very good to help you end up in a high-end traditional journal. Or if it has very high re relevance for the practice of medicine. So it could be something very humdrum and very, you know, not exciting, but if it would make a difference in clinical practice, then... Uh, it tends to get, you know, may end up in a very good traditional journal. So this is what I, I had to say about kind of a traditional publishing and, you know, fighting the battle to get your work to the highest echelons of uh, traditional venues. And while it's become increasingly difficult to get there, and maybe because of that, a lot of other options have come about. So uh, I'll pass the floor here to Bernard to talk a little bit about PLOS one and his experience there. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Julia, for the invitation to talk here. I think, um, as you already indicated, um, publishing is an important part of how to translate the knowledge uh, we gain in our labs and with our patients into clinical practice. And the question is, how do we dis disseminate uh, that kind of knowledge? And as Julia was indicating um, in higher-ranking journals as molecular psychiatry, most of the papers actually get rejected, and many of them who get rejected are qualitatively, qualitatively very good uh, papers. And I think there may be um, um, plus one or other open access um, journals come in which are publishing online only. So what, I, what, I, what you see here on that slide is sort of the general um, statement of publications accepted by plus one. Um, and we'll go to that in, in the next slide a little bit in more detail. So it, it has a rigorous peer review, which is not different to any print media. It concentrates on objective and technical concerns, so maybe not so much about um, particular uh, content, uh, for example. And it's very important that the research has been you know, well conceived and so well executed and the, the uh, results are, are supported by, um, by, the, by the methodology and the conclusions by the results. So I would say that's probably a more technical approach. Um, but I think what it also does is that it tries to accelerate uh, research. And in the last five years, PLOS One in particular has been existing um, as a public, public library of science and various areas like genetics, uh, biology, and, and PLOS One uh, as an additional one. And the impact factor, um, I think, speaks to that acceleration of publications has been raised within two years uh, from, from zero to 4.5. 
which indicates sort of the, the high turnover. Uh, <clears throat> when you look at, at the criteria for publication, again, this is more technical, and I think that's important to note because uh, there's basically no limitation in uh, accepting the number of publications in, in an online-only journal. Um, so you're not restricted in the way that you, you know, press for space, for example. And I think that's a very important point to make. And looking at my, my experience as the editor of, of the neuroscience and psychiatry uh, section, we get hundreds of, of uh, high quality papers and only those who do not fulfill the quality standard of well perceived and well conceived and, and supported uh, re, um, uh, publications, they, they do get rejected. So there's a, there's a large amount of papers who, which get accepted given their, their quality. Um, and in the neuroscience area, and I think the neuroscience psychiatry area which I'm editing is uh, very relevant probably for, for translation of psychiatry from a content point of view, although we do not judge um, the, the acceptance process on content so much. Um, because we, I think what we've heard today that, that neuroscience um, plays the, the, the major driver actually into defining um, the, the, the treatment opportunities, the biomarkers for our patients, and that links very closely to, to what we see in clinical practice. When we compare the open access and the print media on sort of those categories, and some of which has already been done um, uh, by, by Julia and myself. So one is the, the accessibility. So obviously everybody can access open one, uh, open uh, and online um, journals only. That's, that's not a problem with a computer. And the costs are carried by the author, which is, I think, another major difference um, to, to the print media. Although for people who work in the university, we obviously have no problems to having uh, access to, to print media as, as online versions. But I think when you look at the, at the broader community um, and society maybe in general, it might be very good to actually have a very broad access um, into it for, for journal papers uh, to the general community and maybe not only to those who, who, who sit um, and have access. Then uh, print, print media journals are very pressed for space, as we know, so I think that's a major advantage in, in online-only journals that we can accept uh, not only a large variety but also maybe from a content stream point of view um, a larger amount of, of publications there. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the points on high, high impact factors or what we have here in Australia, the quality indicators of ERA, they obviously drive researchers to submit to certain journals or to try to publish in, in the high ranking journals. But I believe that these impact factors, classical impact factors, may, in the long term, may not be the major driver uh, for, um, for publication, um, although it's still very important, but ERA and other exercises in the UK, for example, have shown that, uh, that, that uh, other quality measures are very important. And I believe that sort of the, the turnaround time, was, which, was, which was one of the initial um, characteristics of open uh, access journals that was very short and brief, I think that's probably no longer true, and that's why I put there a question mark for um, the opposite in, in print media, which is supposed to have you know, a more longer term turnaround time, um, that's probably not, not any longer true. And therefore, in a sense, that kind of distinction which you've just seen is a little bit artificial, I believe, um, after you know, these four or five years I've been working in that area of, of open access, because these principles seem to sort of vanish um, between the different, different um, media where we, where we publish. However, I think it's important <coughs> when we publish and we, we, we want to you know, choose a journal, um, what are the, the motivations and what is the quality and the incentives for publishing? And I think that's probably built the, the link to, to the last presentation um, by Professor Mali. So what, what is really the motivation to submit? Is it only the impact factor or is it dissemination or is it a turnaround time or is it the content? Uh, identification with a certain community of people you, you want uh, your article to read, or are there maybe also dissemination um, motivations, like having it widely disseminated, having it disseminated also maybe to other 
um, groups in the community and in the larger society. Then another question is really who is attracted to certain journals? Is that still um, only that the sort of hardcore scientists are attracted to the high impact factor journals like Nature Science and others? Or um, are, what, kind of, what kind of people do we attract? And from the open access plus one experience in neuroscience, we attract uh, many, many papers from the NIH, uh, for example, in the neuroscience area, so really high quality uh, research groups who, who publish um, there. And the, another big question maybe we can discuss a bit later is really how much does the format we provide publications in drive the, the content? Um, so do we, do we get less quality in one or the other, or do we get only certain contents in one journal format um, and not in the other one? And I think that's very important when we discuss translation of psychiatry as, as an area um, to be maybe more in the foreground. How, how do we facilitate uh, choosing which kind of, of format? And Julia may, may be able to discuss that with the new journal on translation of psychiatry, which is an online journal. Um, but also incentives for, for publishing, obviously for, for the people we, we work with. Um, is, it, it costs some money to, to submit to, to certain journals. Um, whereas sometimes people do not have the, the cash flow available for that. And uh, new formats, maybe more sort of hybrids between the two formats might, might evolve in the future. And I think that's what I wanted to say ab about that experience and maybe some, some points here, as I said on the last slide, for discussion uh, later on uh, when we've heard uh, Jin talking. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. And I've got only two slides um, because of really a lot of the things have already been covered and we wanted to really have a flow so we could go on to discussion. It's really exciting to be here, though, because I'm just thinking of or conceptualizing this as sort of a nebula in which a star is being formed, namely transcultural psychiatry. A new journal is, is taking shape. Um, and I think, you know, this is, goes back to Scott's point, you know, what is to be done, particularly around ANZJP, and, and you've no, no doubt noticed a, slight, a gradual shift from Julio's molecular psychiatry to Bernard's PLOS, and now we're talking about ANZJP. One can't help but think you're looking at a downward slope. Uh, and I say that because um, there is a problem that we have in comparing different journals, because different journals have different audiences. Um, and the, the thing that distinguishes ANZJP is that it is a college journal first and foremost. It's supported by a college and as a consequence has quite a different set audience and different uh, needs. The plus side is that it does have um, 3,000 plus members who subscribe to the journal automatically by membership. But that can also be a point of complacency. It can lead to uh, having a captive audience and therefore you don't really strive um, to develop the journal. And that's reflected, I think, to some extent in the impact factor, though it would be interesting to come back to discussions around what the impact factor means and how that's applied. Just a, a, as a starter, though, one example in terms of citations and in terms of uh, perceptions of journals and how they're perceived, um, the British Journal of Psychiatry, for instance, uh, from overseas perspective, is a reasonable journal, has a reasonable impact factor, and, and um, it's a uh, got a, a broad audience. However, within the UK itself, it's not valued, both by the MRC and the Welcome, that see it as a homegrown journal and therefore value it much less than journals across the channel in Europe. And that really does set up a problem for researchers, for instance, in the UK, if they're wanting to have their research rated, even if they published in the BJ Psych, it wouldn't be valued as much by the Welcome or the MRC as much as it would if they were publishing in an overseas journal, which although that the latter journal may actually have a lower impact factor and profile. And so these are issues around, you know, around publishing, which um, I think authors need to be cognizant of, as, as do publishers. Now, the other issue that Bernard mentioned about online and hard copy, the ANZJP is available in both, and there is something still, for, certainly for members, uh, who prefer to have the hard copy. But I can see this, this change uh, very rapidly coming through in, in terms of cost, limiting us to ultimately become online only. And there are advantages. Only last week when we were discussing um, the journal, 
uh, at one of the editorial meetings, the issue about ad additional material came up, and now lots of research requires uh, additional material to be included or at least cited, and it's not possible to accommodate that in a hard copy, and so we were quite happy to be creating a library and creating a data set or bank online for people to be able to access the information who might be interested. Um, and I think relatively recently the journal has gone fully to uh, electronic submission and review, and that's expedited matters, though I think from uh, my experience of a number of other journals, there is still some advantage in having some office or some uh, personal contact with um, those that are submitting, so as to be able to give some proper feedback as to what the delays may be or what the problems may be with the manuscript that they've submitted. Electronic submission can be quite a problem in itself in terms of being quite anonymous. And that's certainly the case for reviewers and the review process, which I think is a separate uh, issue again, which we'll probably come back to. The editorial board, I just wanted to mention because two of the associate editors are in the audience uh, today, Michael Burke uh, and Scott Henderson. Um, and we've tried to capture people from across Australia and New Zealand in order, in order to really reflect the demographic that submit to the journal. What is interesting about uh, um, this particular journal is that the majority of submissions are local still. However, we are getting an increasing amount from overseas. But the, the biggest issue really comes down to what motivates people. Um, and access and turnaround is still a key issue. Um, for the ANZJP, that currently sits around two to three months in terms of getting early online, and it can be somewhat longer for um, hard copy uh, appearance. Now, I've only actually taken over the journal as of January, so it's still somewhat new and still somewhat fresh to some of the data. Um, but percentage-wise, the local versus international breakdown is around 70 to 30 percent. So 70 percent of admission, um, admissions, uh, <laughs> submissions are coming from Australian New Zealand uh, authors, whereas only 30 percent are coming from the rest of the world, which is really quite small for a, for a more generalist journal. And that's the other point that really I hadn't uh, mentioned, that it's probably not in the same bracket of, of neuroscience uh, as the other journals that you've just heard about. And that's really because it is catering to these three groups. Um, and that's been made very clear in discussions both with the college and discussions we've had within uh, the editorial board that there are clinician psychiatrists who want to see a certain set of outputs in this particular journal, things that are relevant to them. And they, I think, on the whole, though they like the research, they really want it nutted down into a key point. Uh, but they would rather prefer reviews or overviews or even editorials or commentaries around a particular issue that, uh, that's of clinical salience to them. The researchers obviously have already been outlined what their particular motivations are. Um, and this type of journal may or may not be able to um, feed into that. And finally, trainees. I think because it's a college journal, again, it does need to have something for the trainees. So this is quite a hard balancing act to have very disparate uh, demands being put on the journal and how to actually uh, br bring all those together. Finally, I just wanted to mention that uh, Julia mentioned about rejection rate, et cetera, and the rejection rate for ANZJP is quite high, it's 75%, but that's really rather inflated, and the reason for that is that the quality of submissions is quite varied as well. I'd, I'd, I'd imagine that the quality of submissions is quite different to some of the other journals, and hence a lot aren't really uh, substantive enough to be published at all. So the, the just having a high rejection rate in itself you know, the statistic needs to be couched in the context of what is the overall quality of, of journals that are being submitted. I'll stop there. So I'd like to open the floor for discussion. We'll pull, pull the chairs to the front here. And p please feel free to ask questions and to, uh, you know, discuss different points. Thank you. Yes. Dev had the question, yes.
No, these are very good points. I think that the issue of uh, open access attaches the first point very, very well. So just repeating the points, the first one was the, the issue of um, translation and accessibility, especially. And then the second one had to do with the how, to, how do you deal with the vast amounts of information that's out there. So addressing the first one, the, the issue of um, you know open access makes a huge difference because even though I mean, I've always been affiliated to some university or another, but you, you are traveling, you are at home, your connection between your, your home network and work is not a functional some days. So if, if you're not um, accessing the internet through a university website, a lot of the print journals will only give you the abstract and you cannot see the paper. And the open access ones will give you that information from anywhere. I actually have uh, two very good friends who are academic oncologists at MD Anderson in Texas. And they said, Julie, you know, it's very amazing to us because they really struggle and go back and forth with this very uh, top tier uh, journals, you know, both general like science and nature, nature medicine, and also uh, cancer cell, etc. So it's like a struggle to publish and they go to multiple review processes. And sometimes it's like a, an additional year, year and a half of experiments to get the paper published. And then he said, what really everybody writes to us about and comments and we get students from different countries are the papers that come out in PLOS 1 because anybody anywhere in the world just goes on the internet and gets the full paper for free. So I think that uh, this issue of open access, it's a little kind of um, costly for the author at the beginning of the process, but then make the material, the full material, not just the abstract, available to anybody anywhere in the world that has an internet, whether you are connected through a big university library or not. Um, I, I would I would just um, con confirm what Julia said that <clears throat> on the other hand maybe to your second point on the translation um, so how do you fill these the, these you know virtual um, space actually in an open access journal with content and um, that's maybe sometimes the trouble we run into from 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 that point of view because basically if there the acceptance is based on technical criteria rather than sort of certain contents then you have limited um, influence on the content. However, the way we try to address that is to have uh, from time to time special issues on, on certain topics and so forth. So you can, you can do that. Um, but I think the, that's maybe related to my last point that we maybe get new formats in the future where we have maybe open access to basically all journals, but drive the content within these journals uh, by which mechanism, that's a, that's a good question, how to do that. Because eventually the editors and the review process, they decide what's, get, what's going to be published and what's not. And therefore we don't see what's not going to be published. And I think open access will address some of these issues related to that of what's usually not getting to go published. Yeah, I'll make some comments and pass to the others, but it, it is an issue. And one thing that uh, there was a very strong movement that um, Harold Varmus began when he was director of the NIH, and I think that that gave the impetus to the PLOS process uh, to begin with. It was him plus some other people. But the idea that um, the information has to be made freely available and to every, everyone anywhere in the world. But the issue is that to this day, there is a cost of uh, to publishing. So it's not, you know, completely for free. And so you need to have like, you have to oversee the process of peer review. You need to have people who do the typesetting and arrange the proofs and deal with the marketing. So there are people that are employed by a journal and need to earn a salary. So a lot of them 
belong to commercial companies that exist to make a profit, such as the Macmillan Group that owns Nature and uh, Molecular Psychiatry and Translational Psychiatry. Elsevier apparently is the second. It's the number one Dutch company. And ne Netherlands is one of the top economies in the world. So the number of companies, <laughs> scientific journal publishing company, the uh, shell is bigger than, than, than Elsevier, but it's a Dutch uh, Anglo consortium. So that's a solely Dutch, the biggest company is Elsevier. So yeah, some people do want to make an extra profit, but some like PLOA, uh, the Public Library of Science, they are not for profit, but they have to at least cover their costs. But there is a cost out there, and it becomes then very difficult if the authors are not going to pay the cost, I mean, the readers are not going to pay the cost, which has been the traditional model. And that's why things are not so easily accessible on the web, because people either have to pay for the paper or have a subscription. But if you abolish that, then the cost has to go to the other side. And yes, it, it is uh, somewhat unfair to the author, especially if you have a big research grant, you know, you just put charge that to the grant, that no, no pain, there's no, no, no issue there. But if you're not uh, externally funded, then it becomes very difficult. How does a, a registrar who has an interesting idea and writes a review and gets it accepted, who's gonna pay the $3,000? Or if you are someone in practice and you've seen a number of interesting cases or a new side effect that nobody has reported yet, and you want to put out there, should you pay out of your pocket for that? So I don't know that there is a very easy answer to that, and I'd like to pass this difficult question to my colleagues who may be more insightful. Um, my view really is that there needs to be a change in terms of valuing publications, full stop. I mean, the uh, problem I, as I see it, it's just, Julia just touched on it, we've all just gone through a phase of writing grants, but I'm sure that no one in their grant put in a quanta which said, for publication of outcomes from this grant, this is the money that I'll be allocating. And that should be built into the grant process. So if we're, if we're expected to have outcomes from the research, and those uh, outcomes are also expected to be published and disseminated, then clearly there has to be an understanding there's going to be a cost associated with that. So why not build that into the grant, just as we do for every other aspect? So that's the first thing. Those people outside of the grant process, I think they do need support. And a good example of that, again, is the area health services. Now, a lot of clinicians um, are employed by the area health service. They won't necessarily be working as a large part of a large research consortium or have their own particular grant or, or, or get funding from university. And there, if again the area health services genuinely want improvement through quality audit or uh, clinical improvement and uh, support clinical research, then part of that should also be to, p to pay for publications. And I've found that in discussions with uh, our area health service, there's been um, real reluctance to do that. And they don't actually understand that particular process. Not necessarily that they're reluctant to give the funding, but they understand the front end cost of doing research. They can understand you need a research assistant, you need to cost of materials, et cetera, et cetera. But for some reason, they don't understand fully that research per se costs and, and publication would cost. So that's really uh, something that needs to, to change in uh, our perception of where publication is. And I think publications then need to be valued. So as a, uh, I think it'll be an iterative process if they appreciate the fact that the message is getting out, that findings are being published and that there's some uh, benefit to area health services or institutions or individuals, then there's more likely to be flow on of money. But, the, but I agree with you about the, the funding is there, has to be there because there is a, a fairly costly process and yet the most costly aspect of this particular model is not funded and that's the reviewers, the editorial boards, the editors and so on. So imagine if that had to be funded as well. That's a very interesting uh, topic um, for those who didn't hear, is the issue of peer review. <coughs> and what is, uh, is there any kind of a hardcore criteria for acceptance or rejection? And should it be really uh, anonymous? So it's a very, very complex uh, point. The 
there has been some push. There was one journal, I forget which one, it's not a very famous one, that actually would put the name of the reviewers after the paper was published. So it would put the name of the paper and then, like, you know, say reviewed by, like, you know, in PNAS you have edited by so and so, they would put reviewed by X, Y, and Z. And the, the, the names would come out there. So that's, that's one model, but the actual reviews are not there. There is another model that I've seen discussed a lot, but I don't know that anybody's actually doing this uh, right now in medical research. But the, the idea has been circulating, which is uh, to provide the very basic screening. Yeah, so if the paper is like horrible and there's like some terrible you know, problem, yes, to not publish. But have a very low threshold. If they are above the threshold, just publish them. And either with reviews or without there being discussion of this model, but then put like an open, uh, like a blog on each paper so people can, you know, post the comments. So anybody can be a reviewer and they post the comments there and people can actually rate the paper. So you would have the paper like you would have the paper with the rating and with the comments beneath it. And then it's kind of a very open process. I'm caught in a quandary that sometimes the people who review for molecular psychiatry, they sign the reviews and implying that they want the, they don't have a problem with the, the, the author of the paper seeing who did the review. But because only a very small minority of people does that very reluctantly, I just go highlight the person's name and delete. You know? <laughs> so the author, the author does not get the names. So it's a very difficult process. You know, do you make the reviewer's names available? Is the review, would people be less rigorous and a kind of nicer if they if they had their names exposed. But the flip side of that is that maybe they are being too nasty under the, the cloak of anonymity. And one thing which I discovered this was one of the first issues of uh, molecular psychiatry was just getting out. This is like you know in the 90s, early 90s. There was a paper that went to someone that I know was a very opinionated person. And my home number has never been unlisted. Some people are very like suspicious. They'd never put the, my phone number. Like if you go to the white pages in Canberra and put my name, you'll see my home number. But I mean, I never thought too much, too much about that. So this was like a long time ago. Uh, I was in my home like eight o'clock in the morning or something. And I get this phone call of this person, very irate, who was the author and found my home number and called me. And she was furious that... Uh, she had suggested some people as reviewers, and I had put uh, two of her suggested people and one that was of my own. And then, very inadvertently, and after this, and I should not have done this at that, that point, and I've never done it you know, before or after, but in some conversation I had with her prior to this telephone call, uh, she said, did you use my suggested reviewers? I said, yes, I used two of them. But it just came out, you know, I just blurted that out. So she got the, the reviewer's comments with three reviews, and, you know, one of them, so if I had told her that I had used two, so one of them was not one of her friends, so, or one of the people that she recommended. So um, she calls me, like, very angry and said, you know, I don't know that person that you chose, who, who he or she is, but he doesn't know anything about the field. And uh, it's talked completely off and went on on this diatribe on the phone. I was like, you know, waking up and <laughs> I think I was just coming out of the shower. And, uh, and I said, what is this, you know? And then when I looked later, that person that she was so angry about was actually her former PhD supervisor and the one that she had, and she had said, if you only had sent to so-and-so that I suspect you didn't, then she, there was another one, she would really have understood what I'm trying to do. And that was the very negative reviewer. But um, thank God there was no internet like at that instance, I only saw that later. But um, people that you think are your friends are not your friends. And I see this, before I would be very reluctant to send uh, to suggested reviewers because I said, oh, this is like, you know, the person's friends. But the people that people suggest tend to be the worst ones. So when I think they hide, that they are your friend to your face, but they hide under the cloak of anonymity and then really <laughs> stick the knife as deep as it goes. So I think that the process is very flawed. And one thing that I, I try to communicate to people, but there is no nice way to say this, is that it's really a very subjective process. So why is paper A, a because I mean, yes, if they come, you know, sent to three reviewers, and there was actually a person who tried to appeal a decision very hard, but went to three reviewers, came to three reject, you know, three recommendations to reject outright. I can't accept that paper, you know, if the person can appeal and then complain, et cetera, but it's not, you know, a gray zone kind of thing. But then you get a paper that has, you know, 
two recommendations for major revision, one for minor revision. Do you accept? Do you send back for review? Do you say, no, we don't want it? So it depends a lot on the area, on the priority, on the strength of the work, on who the reviewers are, because some people are very tough and nasty and they, they always recommend. There was one reviewing molecules, I got a very well-known person in the field that rejected everything that I ever sent to him. And then recently he put, sent one paper back with a major uh, revision and I almost accepted the paper like on the spot. Because after like, you know, 12 years, this person is a very crusty, very famous uh, geneticist who never accepts anything, gets this paper from like a third party, like from some other country, and says that there is some merit there. It should be very special, you know. So sometimes a major rejection can be very good, depending on who it comes from. So it is a very subjective uh, process. And there is, uh, that's why I say that like, you know, it gets to a point that it's almost like, you know, the luck of the draw. But maybe on, on, on the points of uh, re re reviewers' names um, be, be published together with their reviews, actually uh, BMC, Biomedical Central, they, they do this as, as a common. Uh, in PLOS One there is the option, but it's up to the reviewer to decide whether they want their name uh, to be listed or not with, together with the review. And so there are probably different, different procedures, maybe you know, depending on the temperament. Um, of, of the journal to, to, to do that. Um, and probably there's no, no golden rule really to go one or the other way. Well, I just wanted to, to draw on that first point Julia made um, on how, how papers are, whether they are reviewed by two or three people and then sort of going to be accepted or if there are other ways of um, evaluating papers in the larger scientific community. And um, there's actually PLOS One st stimulates that process in addition to a peer review process. So what it, when the paper is actually published, so it's not based on uh, with decision-making process, but when it's published, it's out there and people can make um, you know, comments on the paper in a, in a block sense or an online version. And then papers can actually be modified later on. The, the point I like to make, so that it's a good way to do this, I think intellectually, the point is, practically, there's little use of that mechanism made because it's so time consuming once a paper is published to mm -hmm. sit down and actually type your comments into that uh, and or write back to the author or to the publisher or editor. Um, that's a lot of work and you, you just wonder what is, what is the outcome of that other than you're expressing your opinion maybe. Um, doesn't change the quality of the research. But I think the, to have that option available that the larger community can comment in an online um, uh, environment on, on papers uh, without being sort of subject to, to review process, I think that's a good, good idea maybe. Just sorry, just quickly on, on, on that point. I, I think it's really important that we do think about this model um, of open review. Um, it doesn't seem to be practical, though, unless all the journals adopt it, because I think there's two levels of competition here at the moment. Journals that are vying for papers or certain types of copy, if they were to have such a stringent a threshold for review or to do something that was generally unpopular with reviewers, then they're likely to lose their pool of potential people who would review for them. However, if it was uniform and universal, then I think it would be an accepted practice. In terms of whether you should do it or not, I actually, you know, just picking up on the points that have been made, feel that there would be a lot more clarity about both in terms of the reviews themselves, people would put uh, reasonable effort into putting those reviews together, and it would get away from this double box feedback that we get which, where you have private comments to the editor and different comments to the authors, um, which is always problematic in terms of trying to work out what the reality is, um, often get very, very different views. And I think there should be some open and, uh, and transparent way of capturing the dialogue, because that's, that's actually part of the publication process. And some of the feedback and some of the comments that are even made privately would actually help the authors in improving the, the manuscript. And if we're really wanting to play cricket, then I think we all take on the same rules, and then we, we, we understand it's a competition, but we do it fairly. Um, and that should, over time, weed out people who don't want to play fairly. I'd like to make just, I'll take the questions. I just wanted to make two quick questions. Uh, there is one model that we didn't discuss, which Nature has put out some time ago, and it's not been a complete failure, but it's not been the biggest success either, so it's kind of a lumping along, which is the precedings model. 
So in the physical sciences, people post their papers like on a public website. They get a ton of comments. It's presented in meetings, even cited. And then eventually it's uh, actually published. So Nature created this for the biological sciences as well. And it's a site called Nature Precedings. So you can actually send your paper there and they just check if it's absolute garbage or not. If it's garbage, it gets screened out. But if it's not complete garbage, it gets into the website and you can cite it. And technically, within the Nature family of journals, then you can submit to a journal, can undergo peer review, doesn't count as previous publication. But some other uh, publishing houses sometimes count that as previous publication. The paper then cannot be published there. But there is this idea that the paper can be on the website with comments and you can p people can put comments, they can vote on the paper. But it already exists for biological sciences. It's not used as much, but it's called Nature Proceedings. And then we had two questions here, Jill. Yes. Yeah, that's a very interesting idea to have the institutions or national bodies subsidized the, the cost of uh, open access publishing. And then people who don't have an institutional affiliation, they could be, you know, cross-subsidized. So it's an excellent idea. I know that PLOS, when they have an agreement with certain institutions, that they give like a discount because they, they, they send a lot of papers. But whether that could create a cross-subsidy to others, that's a very good point and should keep that in mind. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a very, very interesting point. Steve had a question, so. <coughs> Yes. Now there is this nature proceedings. That's that's the idea, but it's kind of um, you know, lumping along in a sense.
it is a difficult issue. This, this this thing of the amount of publication and what's clinically relevant and what's you know how can people digest all of that. Bev had raised that before. I think one thing that um, we are partially to blame. I mean, we I'm, I mean like older uh, kind of a more experienced people, which is that information is very easily available now, and I think. I should for sure be, but I think others as well should be much more stringent with uh, younger people like, you know, PhD students, postdocs, uh, clinical trainees, and we should just demand that they know the information that's out there because it's impossible for, like, you know, a senior person to do everything that they have to do, but people who are in training should be very... Um, they are very good with computers, with getting information, with going from one side to the next, and then sometimes you ask very simple questions about what's out there, and they just don't know. So I think we should create an expectation that if you are going to come and, like, you know, be a, me you know, a medical student, a, a registrar, a trainee, a resident, a postdoc fellow, a graduate student, that you should be you could be asked at any point about what's going on in the field, and we expect you to know. And they have all the accessibility, all the availability to know. And there is a lot of uh, just entrenched, how could I say, laziness or not being very, you know, eager to see what's happening. But I think that uh, part of our training process for the workforce should be to require the, <laughs> the filtering and understanding and processing of vast amounts of information. And if they can't do that, they shouldn't be, uh, become professionals. Question in the back. Suppose we were to take... I know that's... A, that, go ahead. Suppose we were to take this... Sometimes there's a section for the public to give special attention. Yes, that's a very good idea. When molecular psychiatry began, we had a section that I called general summary that uh, we would get all the papers, like had a, two paragraphs about each one written in a lay summary, in a lay person's uh, language. And not, not all of them, but the ones that were most, uh, you know, appropriate. But I think that having uh, summaries or kind of maybe a section of journals or a section of the website that's, ex you know, made specifically for people who are not scientists could be very helpful. Just picking up on that point, Scott, I mean, I think with ANZJP, for instance, again, goes back to my point about journals having different audiences and different uh, perspectives. I think that's really a key role for a journal like ANZJP because what has happened in the past few years in particular is that some disorders have been hijacked by the media and um, the representation in the lay press is totally inaccurate, but there's no voice countering it. And I think the journal, particularly a journal that represents a body, should have a means of addressing a concern in the media and rectifying any misinformation. And I think the more we do that, the more likely we are to, again, then capture the interest of the media and be represented there as well. But I think that's a fundamental role. Whether it's actually expressed in lay language per se is a different thing. I think there should be some translational aspects to it so it's easier to understand what the message is, and that can be done in a whole variety of ways, ranging from correspondence to commentaries to editorials, etc. But I think that's a, that's a function of a journal such as ANZJP more so than a, a hardcore science journal, say. Yes. Mm. We have uh, Michael. It, I think it's a very interesting point, and actually some journals uh, have this practice, um, uh, but it's, it seems to be it's sort of at random across the biomedical field where this happens and where not. Um, on the one hand, you want sort of more openness, and we discussed the points on, you know, review your names, be, be, be published, um, and, and not having the distinction between comments to the editor and to the, to the authors. And on the other hand, we want that, that process maybe to be anonymous. So I, I, you, 
you know, as you just suggested, probably that may cause some uh, some friction. If if I was sort of the editor of a journal and do one or the other, I would probably feel um, not not measuring with the same standards both. But I see the value in in that that it's becoming more objective. But that relates back to the criteria of when do journals become uh, sorry papers become accepted and when rejected. And the, the point of subjectivity uh, you made, I think, is very important. It's sort of intrinsically there, but probably with, with orientating ourselves to more objective criteria, we might be able to, to uh, select better. I agree with you, Michael, but I, I, mean, I think you're once again looking at this as a randomised control trial and hoping that the same blinding can be applied. The, the difficulty practically, as you know, is that when you read a paper in the methods and often in the descriptions of how papers are written, um, a particular group will have expertise in a particular area. They will all often cite with the institution they've got ethics uh, permission from. And if they've got a specialised equipment or capacity in terms of a patient cohort, they will describe that and have to describe that. So, for instance, a good example, um, a, a study that you've published time and again in terms of it's been a very rich data source, the Geelong osteoporosis study. I mean, that is, that's what it's called it would be very difficult for you to blind that particular study or indeed the ethics surrounding that. So many papers are inherently biased and you can't uh, have them totally objectively evaluated in that regard. Okay, so um, we had one last question there. <clears throat> No, that's a very difficult question. I, uh, my record has been, because, you know, the reviews don't get paid anything and it becomes a burden and then you have to request like, you, I'm sure that you cannot say yes to all of your requests, so you say no to many. So the editor has to go to re approach more people and more people and more people to get the review. And there is, I think it's a generational shift, but uh, younger people are very, very entitled and it's passing you know, on to the, you know, they become... They grow old and they become researchers. So you get these very nasty uh, letters from authors saying, I've sent my paper like, you know, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. I haven't heard anything. What's, ha what's going on? And like uh, kind of this entitlement when most people are doing that part of the work for free. So there was one paper that I processed that I had to send to 17 reviewers. I mean, request 17 people to be reviewers so that I could get two to get uh, an opinion. And, you know, you don't request 17 people right away. You request, you know, two, three, or four, or five, and then you don't do it, and then you wait a little bit, and then you ask more, and the process goes and can takes a long time. And people get very angry. So it's a very difficult thing because, you know, where do you find all these reviewers? And who is going to do all these reviews? And some people are very specialized. There are just a few people in that area in the world. So um, it is a very tough point. And as more and more journals come up, I don't know how they're going to cope with this problem. But one quick question I'd like to ask Paminda is, you said you reject a lot of these requests. What is it from your perspective when you see an invitation that would make you review a paper as opposed to saying, I can't be bothered to do this? And if it was personalised to you, so if there was a, an invitation from someone...
We have to finish, but there is like one last question here, so let's... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's an interesting point. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So on that note, I think we should stop here and move on with the program. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.